Welcome to Blind Shovel, an arts and music podcast. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with James Kaufman, a former Major League Baseball player turned graphic designer. This was our first time speaking, and we had a great time. Enjoy. So to start, thank you for coming on. Yeah, for sure. I'm immediately fascinated by this whole baseball thing because, <laughs> yeah, I love sports. And when I was young, I either wanted to be an artist or a baseball player. Uh-huh. But I was I was deathly afraid of pop up catching pop ups and just the hard ball in general. Mm-hmm. So that went out the window pretty quick. I think I. Oh, I broke my leg in fifth grade because of a bunch of Catholic school girls uh, <laughs> essentially assaulted me. <laughs> uh-huh. It's kind of a great story, but I never went back to it. And, uh, but I still love sports and going to art school. I honestly, I felt like one of the few people who did. So yeah, totally clearly you're a very unique individual in this sense because you played professional baseball briefly is that correct yeah yeah i was with the uh, arizona diamondbacks for a couple years in their system uh wow what was that like um yeah it was interesting um yeah kind of same as you i I had kind of a dual interest in arts and then sports um my mom's an art teacher Uh, my dad's he's actually a scout for the oakland days the northwest scout uh when I was growing up, he was a minor league coach with them, uh, pitching coach. So I spent my summers kind of traveling around with his team, like down in the Texas league and, uh, stuff like that. So I really grew up around baseball. Uh, and it was just kind of like that. Yeah. Dual personality that I kind of played with. Uh, how do you feel about the diamondbacks logo? Yeah. I think you can't speak about it. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's okay. The old, the old snake's kind of cool. I think that's kind of making a comeback. Um, Oh yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Like I love older logos and there's clearly a comeback in sports logos to embrace. Even in football, they'll be wearing on the sideline, like 1930s, really illustrative. The Patriots have one. The Cowboys have one. It's just like an actual mascot logo. Mm -hmm. I feel like, the aesthetics of um, sports logos is super interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to bring it back to football, God, that Rams logo is pretty brutal. I don't know how they got away the with new that one? one. The new one, it's yeah. bad. It's, it's so bad. bad. It's like somebody that just learned how to use a pin tool on Illustrator. Um, but yeah, the the Diamondbacks logos, I think it's all right. It's pretty good. We had a we had a hat uh, during my first year in spring training that everyone just. It looked like a prison tattoo. It was it was pretty brutal, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So I take it during that time. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like were you dedicated to baseball and then that ended and then you became dedicated to design or it's kind of commingled throughout your whole life. Yeah, I mean, baseball was always a focus. Um, like my identity was pretty much a baseball player. 23, 24, something like that. When I, uh, got done playing, um, art was always kind of in the background. I enjoyed doing it. Uh, yeah, but baseball was for sure. The focus, um, played through college, uh, and then, uh, signed with the diamondbacks, played a couple years of that. And then when I got out, it's kind of like, you pretty much just have no bearings to where your life's going. Uh, I, I started painting, put on a couple of shows and stuff wasn't very good, (laughs) but what uh, age did you stop playing baseball? Uh, I want to say like 23 or 24 or something was my, was my last year. Uh, which is interesting because you just feel so old (laughs) at like 23, which is really different than the art world where it's like everyone in your is either like 70 or dead. Uh, but yeah, you're playing with like, 17 year olds from the Dominican that are 
making millions of dollars and you're uh, 23 and kind of on your last legs and feel like the old man, which is really, really weird. Uh, so did you just come to this conclusion that you weren't good enough at that age? Like what is the decision to just stop playing baseball once you're two years in? Yeah. Um, it's pretty few people would just decide to stop. Uh, some people do, but it's usually the front office gives you up a call or gives you a call and basically says, Hey, like, we're not going to have a spot for you next year. I kind of saw the writing on the wall when they, I think they drafted like a third rounder and a fifth rounder in my position. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yeah, I'm probably not going to see much time next year. And then they, you know, called me up that winter and kind of said the same thing. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, kind of how it ended. Uh, I could have gone and played overseas, but I was just kind of, you know, wanted to do something new. I did have this, uh, interest in art that I wanted to explore and kind of see where that went. Um, initially I thought I was going to go get a design degree and go work for Nike. Um, but kind of, kind of took a different path. Thankfully. Uh, was that, was that was just like your, um, North star as you were learning, like working for Nike. Yeah. It just kind of seemed like a good, uh, that's cool. Good mix of the two of design arts and, uh, athletics. Um, felt like a world so you, could kind yeah, of yeah. fit into. Mm. So you aim high when you aim. Yeah, I don't mean clearly. I don't know how many. I don't know how many designers at Nike <laughs> designing sock packages would uh, would call it their north star. That's actually kind of why I decided not to go. We had a somebody come to our class uh, from Nike. She basically just said, "I design thirty sock packages a week, and it eats your soul." So. <laughs> Kind of, oh, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, her. right. At least she was honest. Um, you know, I knew like a dude who worked for Nike for a bit, and he's he's great. But I mm -hmm. think more in a freelance capacity. You know, like yeah, I think that's in the way and to out go, for sure. So, at twenty four ish, mm -hmm. did you just start? How old are you now? Uh, I just turned thirty, like a couple weeks ago. Wow. So, is that the first moment you really take? design seriously in terms of a profession? Uh, yeah. So right after I got out, I started painting, um, kind of figured I'd want something more practical. So I signed up at, uh, Portland state here for the design program. Uh, went there for a couple of years, kind of got my bearings, learned some stuff, uh, had some great teachers. And then after that kind of sort of lazily dropped out, I just didn't sign up for classes and figured I'd try and make it as a freelancer and I could always go back and finish, uh, if I fell on my face and that was maybe like four years ago, something like that. Four or five years. Yeah. So it's, uh, largely worked out and I haven't had to go back and finish that degree, but yeah. Do you think, cause I'm always thinking about the relationship between sports and, uh, art for me, the beautiful objectivity of sports is something I love when you lose, you lose when you win, you win. Um, I like team sports cause I have four older brothers. So I gravitate towards things where there's like shame when you lose, you know, like yeah. external shame, mm -hmm. uh, and external ecstasy, like the most depressing periods of my life were clearly just because I didn't play enough sports, um, and just made art. Like it was, a, mm -hmm. it was just a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. I need balance there. But design for me, I used to make comic books a lot and they were very obscure and abstract, but design offered me like more of a sports framework where I could objective in some ways, objectively succeed in the eyes of the client. Mm. It felt like I could know when I succeeded. Um, do you feel that with design that it's like there's it's less nebulous than making a painting? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, art can just be so, I don't know, subjective, but I don't know, bad art gets covered up with just, oh, somebody will like it kind of subjectivity, which is, I kind of hate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah. that in some of your writing. That, <laughs> no, I, I try not to yeah. go too hard into that because, I mean, everybody does have taste, I guess, but some stuff's just objectively bad and uh yeah, I believe but, that art is far more objective, even fine art than people believe. Um, 
the only real reason people relativize it is so that they don't know that they're bad at it. Um, and people who go to college who, who really don't know anything about art, but want to critique it. I mm. think they, they wield that in a certain sense. Um, uh, but I feel that most artists I know could, there's actually this Kurt Vonnegut quote about his daughter who was an artist that she could rollerblade through a museum and tell you at full speed what was good and what was bad. And that's, you know, it's hyperbolic, but I feel pretty confident in that. Totally. Yeah. I think it just, a lot of it comes from people are scared to put their taste on view. So they don't want to be wrong about something. Uh, so they'll just, you know, applaud, applaud anything. My God, I saw a video a while back. That's maybe you've seen it or somebody has somebody with a charcoal pencil and they start at one end of a room on a blank white wall and sprint across drawing a line and they jump on a trampoline and then finish. And it's just a line that kind of goes up and down. And then everyone in the room applauds. And I'm just like, it's, right. it's really terrible. I wonder if that's uh, Matthew Barney's obstructions. It, it may or may not be, but I don't know if you know about Matthew Barney, but he is one of the few fine artists that incorporates athleticism into mm -hmm. his work. Uh, I used to like it, but I kind of woke up and uh, he's cool in some ways. He was like a fashion model and I think an athlete, but, you know, he'll be like jumping again on a trampoline and like drawing on the ceiling. Mm. And it's like these physical limitations. And then the mark making is supposed to represent the process, which really isn't that interesting visually. But mm. I wonder if that's who you're talking about. It could be. I'll have to, I'll have to dive in a little deeper on that then. <laughs> It's not really worth it. Um, it's, just, it's like <laughs> the insatiable desire of fine art to consume everything, you know, instead of just staying in a lane and then claiming that it's elevated that thing by consuming it instead of just letting athletics be athletics and beautiful unto itself. There's this kind of uh, desire for fine art to just metastasize and spread into every every crevice, I find. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That's interesting. But you were saying that your influences are either 70 or dead. And um, yes. are those specific people or, or an aesthetic from a time period that's past or places that are? Yeah, it's a, I don't know, probably my biggest influence is just, and it's kind of boring to say, but Picasso, like once you actually really dive into all his work, um, and just kind of what he did throughout his life. He's just such an interesting person. Um, yeah, not a, not a great person, but a, definitely an interesting one. Could be uh, worse. Yeah, for sure. It could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say uh, Picasso one, because you mentioned him offhand in some of the writing, but it's also very evident by the uh, composition and the bulls. I feel like yeah. the presence of bulls and, uh, and just the way you handle vases and flowers, like, I feel like those are very much in his vernacular. Mm, absolutely. And yeah, the, the faces I draw are pretty directly a reference to some of his graphic work and yeah, pottery and everything else he did. Um, yeah, I think I've read just about everything you can find on him. Um, but yeah, him and just kind of everything that was going on in Paris and kind of the teens and twenties, I've just found really interesting in the full, full amount of good, uh, influence from kind of that time maybe in subject matter less than aesthetics uh yeah well i think both can be seen in some sense um mm -hmm. what about the futurists i found le recently that the futurists for me are becoming more and more interesting uh, the italian futurists with like de Pero, uh, the way they play with type is very crazy it's very uh, design minded oh absolutely i think God, I went through a futurist phase a couple of years ago. I should get back into it because I probably have a greater appreciation or understanding of it now. Uh, but yeah, their type work is ridiculous um, compared to what was going on before them too. Uh, it almost feels like it came out of nowhere, but yeah, it's, the futurists are amazing. Uh, love their stuff for sure. Yeah, it's very, well, their manifesto is based around this speed. So you can call it athletic. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a there's a masculine thing there. There's a clarity. Um, I do logo work as well, but I don't really put it out there. And that's what I value is kind of um, 
I don't know how to say it's like not self serious, but it, you know, I see it in your work too. There's a, it's a classy seriousness, you know, like it's not corporate, you know, um, it could hold its own almost as not a logo at times, mm-hmm. you know, just an image. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it just feels like a lot of design is so whimsical and kind of just, uh, we're just having fun. Don't take it too seriously kind of. And I just, I don't know, maybe my stuff is a bit of a pushback against that. Um, just, yeah, I think you should take art seriously and try and actually wrestle with it and understand it uh, more so than just kind of it being a ends to a means to sell somebody something. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think clarity is a good word. Like you said, uh, yeah. Is there... You know, typically I ask people a lot about this, you know, when you're younger and you start making art and that's your identity, the transition into a commercial artist can feel like defeat or shameful because you had this aspiration of this pure thing. And then you resort to a practical thing, commercial thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you painted briefly, but I can't imagine you feel that way you know, you came from the baseball thing. It seems natural you would fall into design, but like if you had infinite money, would you sit around making paintings that don't serve a commercial function or would you continue doing what you do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I do a ton of painting still. It looks a lot more like, uh, my graphic work now. Uh, and I really enjoy it and, you know, plan to eventually put on some exhibitions and do stuff like that. But, uh, there's definitely like a purity to just creating art for art's sake and not working with clients or people. Um, and I've thought about that too, but I kind of have found clients and, uh, having your work in a commercial sense can kind of elevate it in ways that you wouldn't be able to do on your own. Um, if that makes sense, uh, more of like a collaborative effort than, just, uh, you know, making something and putting on a wall for people to enjoy. Uh, yeah. I view it pretty simply like maturity is marked by service to others and Mm -hmm. design has that quality. And, uh, at least for me, self-expression at the moment represents a kind of more infantile phase. I get something out of it when I do it, but it's more limited by what I myself seek to express. Whereas collaboration, and design pushed me into places where I would never think to do something probably because of certain, you know, mental blocks or being perceived in certain ways. So I've always found that leveling up occurs maybe more rapidly within design. Um, Absolutely. That's another really great point. I think you kind of find your best work when you put constraints on it if you just tell yourself I'm going to make whatever I want to make, it's so loose that you kind of never really have to grind through something or work through something. Uh, and it's just kind of, it's just some flat service level idea when you actually have, uh, someone telling you a need and you trying to fulfill that you really have to, you can't go outside the box. You kind of have to go right to the edge of the edges of the box and kind of pull from there, which is a, something you don't have to do when you're just working uh, for yourself. Yeah. It's a truly difficult skill set. And I know you wrote some things about finding the right clients, which essentially is dating. I think Um, Uh, (laughs) finding the right person to date, finding the right client, showing who you are up front or kind of, not doing so and the repercussions of that um that took me a while to to understand but do you think the team-based nature of sports and baseball etc do you think that lends a hand in this process of working with a client and kind of knowing where you're fitting into this equation uh yeah i haven't really thought about it like that but i'm sure it does uh 
I think it's just being able to like, yeah, communicate, talk to people, work together that uh, is, is helpful for, uh, for making projects run smoothly. Uh, I think language is borderline just as important, important as a, your ability to create, if you can talk to somebody and like actually find out what they want and need, uh, you can translate that into design um, much better than, I don't know, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, no, it does. I mean, it's so much more complicated than it appears to be. Um, the reason I emphasize the sports thing so much is like coming from yeah, just like an artist sitting in a room and, and what comes with that, which I think is a stunted maturity, frankly. I think it's really hard to grow socially in that setting. I think it's hard to grow when you quote unquote, do what you want, um, eight hours of the day. But again, the value of sports for me is like, there's such a clear, the realities keep pinging off each other. And you can't really fool yourself about your utility. If you're a great, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's not as clear for me in baseball, honestly, but when mm -hmm. I play other sports, it's like, it's pretty clear. Like if you take football, you know, this yeah. is where you're going to fit in based on those natural inclinations and your physical form. So like you're confronted with these restrictions far more than the way fine art is set up but in design this is the same thing. Like, and you have a very clear path, it seems to me. Like, you know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know what you like. There's a very cohesive aesthetic. Um, it's almost a place to me. There's, uh, maybe it's Ameri It's like American, but like Southwestern. I don't know. I'm not that good at spotting. Being from New, being from New Jersey, I'm not sure I can identify exactly. <laughs> uh, what do you think that sure is? You yeah it's a it's the southwest thing i've kind of tried to move away from and i do, don't do myself favors because i still you know put an agave or something on there um but that's definitely a really influence from uh you know other designers i really loved and kind of tried to emulate uh now god i i really pull from as many places i can find a lot a lot of french french art um a lot of americana kind of kind of wherever I'll try and kind of wrap it in the cloth of my own aesthetic. Um, I try not to really pull directly from cultures too much. It's kind of a really sensitive subject. Um, but you mean like reference. appropriation or something? Yeah, exactly. Like I'm not going to take a, I don't know, some historic Mexican design and just slap it on something and change the colors or something like that. Um, but I'll, I don't know, take that feeling I get from it or pieces of it and kind of wrap it into something new. Uh, yeah. Well, what is your perspective on that? I've always found that topic interesting in a sense. Um, I completely don't subscribe to it as a problem. Um, mm. It's simply that one should appropriately change something to the degree in which, to which they own it. But being inspired by other cultures, I just... I've never bought it as a problem. Um, you know, like the designs have different languages. They feel, I don't know how to, I'm trying to pinpoint how they feel, but they kind of do feel, um, it's funny to me. It's like, they feel American, but at the same time, they feel like, like as if another culture has come into America and then was processed through, through its lens or something, you know, there's these different, there's French often, it seems right. Is this, mm -hmm quite a bit of French. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in the, of the same mind as you there. I, I don't think it's a real problem. I think people like to get upset about it because it's something to get upset about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe something more primal. I don't want to say cave paintings just cause it's kind of a little too on the, nah, that's fine. You know? Yeah. But, uh, it's fun. It's foundational. Yeah, exactly. Something just, that kind of feels inherent to everyone's humanity. That's just like something from the past a little bit, uh, just like the really boiled down symbolism, uh, that then incorporates kind of more complex messages or more historical messages, I guess. Um, 
Yeah. I do like that. And I use similar techniques where like, I feel that your process, is your process digital or uh, hand, are the logos hand painted? Uh, it's pretty much all digital. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, this idea that you have to humanize the digital in its sterility for, versus, um, you know, maybe using like stamp methods mm -hmm. or, um, well, the stamp I find really useful or the textured paper. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to feel that was like a lie that I couldn't do that. And then I, I kind of got over it, honestly, but back in art school, I was like, digital things should look really digital and, you know, hand done things should look hand done and they should never cross. Mm -hmm. But that became a very limiting perspective, honestly. Yeah. And I think just the way our resources and technology has gone, it's like, I think some of the work I make, it looks hand done. I get asked all the time, like, is this ink on paper? Uh, and it's, I do it in procreate and I've got a couple textures and brushes I like to use and it's all hand drawn still. I don't, I don't use a vector shapes or anything like that or the pin tool. Uh, so it's still my hand, but it's, yeah, it's, a definitely has a more tactile real world look and feel, uh, that you probably couldn't have got 10 years ago working on an iPad or, uh, most programs. No, yeah, totally. Or even on the website, I see like the stamped leather, like all these, these ways to, you know, the only way I could say it is like dirty, dirty, mm -hmm. the logo a away from that corporate, perfectly clean logos of like the eighties, mm -hmm. right? which I still like for their clarity, but it just seems it's funny to kind of um, have to take these steps to create like human intimacy intentionally, <laughs> the material doing that naturally it's um you have to work it kind of backwards in a weird sense uh, for sure absolutely yeah corporate stuff for sure has its place and i appreciate it in its own right um but yeah just there's something that kind of connects when it's it feels like it's real and like something that somebody sat over a desk with or stamped in the paper something like that just connects on a, on a different level i think so how did you start, you know, what was the, it sounds like school didn't serve you too well, which frankly, I think all the graphic designers that I knew in my school were, were hopeless. They, they clearly were just like kind of meandering and their parents were like, just do the one major at this school that might make you money. And they had no, they had no passion about, it was crazy to me. They had no passion about like, like the great graphic designers that I was yeah. interested in. They were just like, they were primed for that, just doing layouts or doing socks or whatever. And there's nothing, well, there's plenty wrong with it, frankly. It's not a full, <laughs> it's not a full expression of one's potential. And I have a problem with that. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of school and influences and just the process of getting to where you are now, which looks like I'm sure you're financially sustaining yourself via this practice, what did that journey look like? Yeah. I mean, I really liked Portland state was a great, uh, place for me to go. I had some teachers that are extremely talented and genuinely cared and weren't just there because it was a paycheck. Um, and I think, yeah, I got that same feeling. There's maybe not quite to the same extent, but there were definitely a good portion of students that were just there because, it was something they could do to get a job down the road or it was like, you might as well go to business school and then just kind of, kind of go that route. Um, there are, there are a handful of people I went to school with that are pretty successful designers now or making a living and caring about it. Uh, in a way, I think we'd both appreciate it more so than the rest of them. Uh, yeah, I, I never really got that. I was, I went in and was like, I really fell in love with it and it was something I knew I wanted to do forever. Like I'll, I'll never retire. I'll, you know, keel over walking back from the studio at 93 or something like that. And I'll be mm -hmm. happy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Do you imagine you'll be doing this? Well, obviously you do pottery as well. And like you're saying, you do painting, but do you imagine, uh, you know, when you imagine your career trajectory, 
beyond this. Do you see it kind of following in this this kind of um, branding identity path? Yeah, I I go back and forth on it. Um, I think it'll shift to fine art eventually, more so. Mm-hmm. It kind of teeters sometimes. Um, but I, I still love design. I'll, I'll probably keep doing branding and projects and things like that. Uh, like I said earlier, just makes you think differently and kind of elevates everything. And I appreciate that. The selfish side of me wants to just paint, and, you know, put it up in a gallery and have everyone celebrate it. <laughs> like, it, I mean, who wouldn't want that? But, uh, yeah, I think it'll be a blend of the two. Uh, I for sure ad- admire all the great designers that came before me and everybody currently out there. But I think my heart really goes to the fine arts and, uh, hmm. painters and potters and all that. So who are those for the, for you, who are the great designers? Oof. Cause you know, like there's, there's a modern crop of like, this isn't even that modern, but like Sagmeister who's in a whole different world. You know, it's not really visual first design. It's more conceptual. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that. Um, but I'm curious for you who would be like, I, I did gravitate a lot and I still do to illustrator slash designers or fine artists slash designers. Um, yeah. That's a good question. I, I'll tell you the ones I like right now that are out there. Uh, John Contino, if you know him out of New York, I, I, he's kind of the one that got me thinking that I could make my way in design, kind of just a atypical personality uh, that you wouldn't really expect. Um, yeah, he, he's probably the of this kind of current generation, probably the biggest one. Uh, People like Real Fun Wow, if you know his work. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. I'm, I'll look, I'm gonna look into. You know what? I think I honestly. Oh, what is? This? I once tried one Domestica course, and I think it was this dude on how to make a hand drawn uh, logo. John Contino. Yeah, guy with a Yankee hat, probably. Yeah, yeah. He's very like. <laughs> uh, he's very much from where I'm from. Mm, like. Uh, for sure. I don't know how to describe it. It's like, uh, I mean, macho design wouldn't be it, but there's a quality of like bro-ishness, you know? Yeah. A little kind of, definitely not your art school student with the rolled up beanie and glasses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I appreciate how he kind of took design and kind of made it his own thing. And it's a little grungier. And I mean, you can probably see a, just like the illustration style, there's a bit of similarities there. Not a ton anymore, maybe, but definitely early on, that was the guy that I kind of was my North star for uh, design work in general and kind of that. I respect yeah, that. N- not fitting into, a, you know, like I said, the design student mold. And so when you're looking at fine artists, um, I'd be curious who you find influential there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, like I said, I mean, uh, Picasso are they mostly, Keith. uh, okay. So there, I was going to say they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> most, most of them are mostly dead. dead. Uh, Chagall, uh, definitely. Wow. Uh, that's bold. See, like that's, I'd struggle with Chagall for a real long time. And I, I like that you like him because one, it's fashionable to not like him. Um, mm-hmm. One, because Chagall himself would kind of talk down on himself and Picasso also would be like, you suck. And I think <laughs> I think largely they might both be right about Chagall not being great. But there's something about his compositions when you open your heart and you're just like, all right, let me stop judging this. There is something about the compositions. Yeah, and I think he just, what I love about it, it just feels like everything has such meaning packed into it, even if it's not always pretty. Or just like, I don't know, the correct way to do something. It's just, there's something visceral about it that I appreciate. That's a, it's tough to unpack and I, I like it. Um, but yeah, he's, he's one, uh, maybe a good blend of the two is, uh, Bill Trailer. Mm-hmm. If you know him. Yeah, yeah. He's a, 
I've always liked his work, just kind of that flat and graphical nature that's rough and raw. Um, I've pulled, yeah, a good amount of inspiration from him. Um, yeah, you think. like that immediacy, that kind of primal immediacy. Mm -hmm. With the trailer, I can understand the the compositional resonance where the scale is kind of like a pattern, you know, kind of a central thing, then little ones around it. Mm -hmm. Totally. Uh, yeah, it definitely has that kind of, yeah, graphic design branding nature where it's almost like a central image that's made to be the focus. And then there might be other stuff going on around it, but you kind of know what's, what's important. Um, right up front yeah 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 the respect to font creation uh how'd you end up there and, and what's your process for doing so is it is it more like finding a old font and then kind of translating it or, or are you exploring these different yeah uh, it's a it's a mix between those actually uh the first font I ever made was in design school um i was working on some project and i would just looked on every everywhere i could find for a couple of days and couldn't find anything that didn't feel uh it was like a southwest style i think it was like a mezcal mm -hmm. something like that uh and everything just felt like this cheap cowboy bandito kind of something that just kind of made a mockery of whatever i was trying to do rather than actually fit in um so i kind of just made my own and it it worked out and then uh I, I used it and then people in class wanted it and I sent it to them. And one of my teachers kind of jokingly was like, Oh, you should sell this. Like you can make a killing. And then I did. And <laughs> that's kind of what started it. Um, yeah. And then I just kind of fell in love with making fonts and using them in my own work. Uh, I think it's such a good way to not elevate, but uh, it's your hand rather than someone else's hand. Uh, on everything you type out so it yeah, kind of yeah. matches up with your illustrations more so than if you just you know took something off creative market and slapped it over the top uh yeah it all no, makes sense. feels part, makes part sense. of the same world which i think is huge in creating your own aesthetic yeah when i see lettering for my comics i would just type out like Arial font and then i would trace the whole thing by hand and that alone was enough to Oh yeah. Break the, what would you say? Kind of like the monotony, the perfection uh -oh. of the thing. Mm -hmm. But yes. this, I'm, I'm assuming they're all mono spaced, right? Uh, yeah, they are. That's Pretty inspiring. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I need to, uh, I should do that more often. All my friends who do that, I, have, I know a sign painter who does that. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, you, you might know his, his work, Bill Rebels. He Don't does. Uh, I think you would love his work, honestly. That sounds familiar. Um, yeah, he's a great, great sign painter. But he's I done some it. fonts, and uh, it's always refreshing to see because, despite the thousands of fonts on Adobe Fonts, like mm -hmm. there is a weird. I don't know. I guess sterility is the word. Yeah, that's a good word. Um, it's a true lack there. You know, like it's easy to fall on them and lean on them. Would you say in your practice in general, you you just kind of pick from what you've created here? I see that you have this like bundle on your shop. Yeah, I, I pretty much just use ones I've created. Uh, I have some friends that create fonts too that are in a similar aesthetic and I, I'll occasionally use those, but I just find when I'm when I draw something and then I just put up a font that's preloaded, it just stands out like a sore thumb. It's just, it breaks what you're trying to do. Like here's something that's rough and kind of has its own life. And then here's, like you said, just Ariel is kind of staring back at you with its perfect lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Do you yeah, have think, a group of, uh, you live in Portland? Mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon. Yep. Do you have a need for the team? Like, do you have a tight group over there that you work around with, bounce work off of, et cetera? Um, 
I'm getting better at it. I, I grew up here and then I was in California, kind of in the Bay area the last few. So I moved back and I've been just kind of making connections with people I respect, not necessarily in, uh, graphic design, all kinds of art fields, but that's definitely something I've been trying to do more is connect with like-minded people. Uh, Instagram makes it easy. I've got a ton of, ton of folks on there that I know and talk to regularly, uh, that kind of do the same thing I do, uh, which definitely helps. But as far as in-person stuff, there's probably like a group of five or six, uh, yeah, people that I see and talk to about art. Yeah, I think that's very important. Mm-hmm. It's al- almost just to feel, just to stay on track, you know? Yeah, totally. And I'm not, uh, I'm fairly introverted. I don't need to be around people or, you know, I'll stand at the corner of the party and maybe have a conversation with one or two people, but that's about it. Uh, but yeah, it's just, there's something special about being able to connect to people through art and actually talk about the subject deeply where they understand it and, you know, can kind of bring new insights to you and you can bounce off each other. There's something funny about baseball where I feel like maybe being an introvert works a little more than other sports. There's this weird mm-hmm. solitary quality to baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. I just remember being in the outfield and being, <laughs> I don't know, like the, stero- the not the stereotype of the kid like picking flowers or grass because I was very focused <laughs> on the game. But there's this atomized. I mean, it's truly America's sport, and I don't mean mm-hmm. that in a derogatory sense, but it has embedded all these these values into it. And there's like this weird sense of negative space in respect to waiting and just like chilling on a bench. Uh, there's that kind of, I don't know, you get up to the plate, it's basically just you. It's almost like you're just mm-hmm. waiting. Yeah. Um, I've Not sincerely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a team sport played by individuals, which is a pretty good microcosm of America, probably. That is the goal. That is the goal. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that, but like, I'm trying to think th- through my own lens, like, why was I attracted to, the, to these two? seemingly disparate things and i've never spoken to someone who professionally played baseball and then became a professional designer so i think you have a unique perspective you know Mm -hmm. yeah definitely throws people when i drop the background uh yeah not not super common (laughs) and then home like home plate home plate Mm -hmm. is just weird (laughs) like the shape or the what do you mean (laughs) the shape for sure, yeah. Is it isn't it is it a house? I mean, what? How do they come? Yeah, a little upside down. So tiny, out. tiny house. <laughs> the geometry of baseball is really interesting. I think from from the perspective of like looking at the work and and um, other sports, which are largely just rectangles. Uh, there's something very weird about baseball: the shapes, the way circles intersect, the diamonds the irregular fields that are not standardized. Yeah. I've always found that like, like really the way that the, you know, Fenway park has like a character. It's, it's a very fascinating game. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah. There's a, yeah, every park is very different. That's such a common thing when you smoke a ball out a right field or something and somebody catches the warning track cause it's 380 feet out there instead of, 3.30, like at home. <laughs> it's one of the more frustrating things, but, but yeah. Do you have any um, strange relationships to any particular location? Like, do you, do you love Fenway Park? Do you hate Fenway Park? Um, God, I, I mean, my dad works for the A's. I grew up an Oakland A's fan. So kind of, kind of always hated Boston in general and the Yankees, I guess. Kind of hated <laughs> that northeast uh i don't know my my people yeah i, I mean i hate yeah. them just too you know I, but i'm i'm grown enough to acknowledge that if one really hates the yankees they might just hate excellence or they might just hate like kind of a hoarding a giant that they are um that's my father's a mets fan and oh. uh, I have a brother who's a Yankees fan, but I think it says a ton about people when they're Yankees or Mets fans. I personally like the Toronto Blue Jays, and I think 
three steps there's four. very little logic uh, except aesthetics and I, I i almost always pick my sports teams on like aesthetics and color mm. but then that didn't diminish the kind of axiomatic obsession with the team uh despite it not being regional it was just mm-hmm. like maybe for me that's what mattered and the blue jays looked great in the 90s they do they have some good unions that's that's funny though yeah I, i'm a pretty big portland trailblazers fan which can be rough at times but it just i don't think i despise anybody more than lakers fans that didn't grow up in la it's just like this yeah you're rooting for goliath all the time essentially right right so there's that like i don't know i I struggle with it right like i respect david and i've always i always skew towards underdogs but I can't tell if it's just like some pre immature kind of like desire to see greatness be pulled down or, or mm-hmm. if it's just a novel kind of narrative. I like that the thing that's supposed to happen doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. I grapple with that. I yeah, try to, I try to admire excellence instead of going like, like I can look at certain artists and just be, comfortable saying that will they will be better than me forever (laughs) there's nothing i can do i can i i should struggle to be at their level my whole life um but i can also recognize like undeniable genius uh picasso being one example and that doesn't make me want to stop you know totally yeah it's a yeah use them as inspiration or a goal to reach, even though you you'll never reach it. I don't I don't know if anybody will ever <laughs> reach Picasso level in my lifetime. Probably, probably not. But yeah, I don't even know what it would look like to to, to be in that space anymore. There's this like, you know, there's the uncomfortable reality. You're born with the constraints of your time and and the particular technological nature of it or cultural nature. And there was a time. Matisse, etc. That period in France. That's very special. And mm-hmm. on a planet with billions of people, it was like a handful of people. Yeah. And attention was so centralized. It was kind of feast or famine. Where now it's, it feels much more spread out and people are easier. You can kind of connect at smaller levels where there's probably more artists that can support themselves. Um, and probably fewer that make obscene amounts of money. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like it seems no, like it I, might be. I think you're right. Mm-hmm. I think even the fact that like you you came out and started approaching this at a a relatively late age, you know, like twenty three, mm-hmm. twenty four, is a testament to the ability to kind of jump, kind of jump in there. Because I would say six years and to reach where you're at is is impressive. You know. Um, I'm sure that that work ethic of baseball and sports probably helps, right? Just that kind of regularity that, that discipline required. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny to say, but my first few classes in design school or my whole way through design school, I was like trying to make my stuff so good. It would actually like make the person that presented behind me feel bad, which is not a normal way to approach art, but that was just like my, my athletics. Wait, say like, oh. wait. <laughs> say that again. Yeah. You're trying to make it so good. Yeah, I would try and like kill this project and just make it so good it would embarrass like the person that had to go after me to like present and follow that. Um I like that. a very nice way to go about it. But I mean it, it worked. I definitely was very driven early on to get as good as I could and yeah. I miss that. I miss um, channeling my, I don't know if it's aggression. It's just just like I love competition. And I I liked when it was um, commingled with my art making. Mm -hmm. I live in a suburb of New Jersey. I don't feel that I'm actively competing per se. I have different motivations, largely cooperation. Mm -hmm. Cooperation is beautiful, surely. But there is a kind of dark side Sith you know, energy, powerful energy to, um, competition that can be very healthy. It's just, that it's just 
works best when like people know it's happening, you know, like as opposed to like secretly competing with an oblivious graphic design student who goes after you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd never like openly talk shit to anybody in class, but it was yeah. all, all in my head. But like I said, I mean, yeah, it's, I definitely mellowed out <laughs> since then. It's like you said, definitely more cooperative now than anything. Uh, but yeah. Do you feel that when you're doing branding, et cetera, that at this point you work for companies and with companies that you're happy to assist in their process to sell something to someone? Do you ever have a qualms? Cause like I, I do commercial work, I do fabrication and, and a bunch of stuff. And like, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm in the right position, but you know, there's times where I have to be in a less than optimal thing. Is there, are you generally working with the clientele? I mean, it seems to me like you are, but that you, you would prefer to like Coors Light, I see, or Seeger. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you uh, feel like it's my, pretty in line with your value set? For sure. Yeah. My portfolio is super out of date. I got to update that, <laughs> by the way. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I definitely only work with people that I think uh, have good intentions for my artwork. I've, I, I turn down, I get a lot of emails and inquiries and I turn most of them down. Uh, kind of my rules are you have to be a good person. You have to like actually like and respect my art uh, and kind of know what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, you have to kind of have like a decent or at least neutral goal with what you're doing um, in your business. So yeah, I, I really only work with people that I have a mutual respect for or have interest in uh, the type of project they're, they're working on. Like I was in, I lived in Napa Valley for a couple of years and kind of got into wine. It's like I took on some wine projects just because it was something that was interesting to me that I wanted to explore more through the work. Uh, but yeah, as far as moral qualms, it's funny. I just uh, did a project with Zara, like a mm. full collaboration. I think it came out like three years ago, something like that. Uh, and they're a pretty big global clothing company. Uh, the people that I worked with were great. It was a, probably the smoothest project I've ever had. Uh, I had like full control, but as soon as I put it out, there was a couple people in my DMs like, like, wow, like, why are you working with this terrible company? Like you'd think I was working with a uh, Raytheon or something like that. Some, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, well, so that was interesting. Well, what, I'm oblivious to the macro moral context of Zara, but what exactly is going on there? Um, they can be. I think they're they're better now. Every I mean, I did ask, and it seems like they have uh, things in place to make sure there's not as much waste or things like that. But uh, they're sort of fast fashion. I don't think they're, they're not as bad as like H and M or Sheen or something like that, but, uh, yeah, they're a pretty, pretty huge company. And, uh, yeah, a few people thought having my name on that was morally Come on. I don't know, in, ambiguous or something like that. <laughs> Which, I mean, well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, they, I said, they sound want... like, uh, Puritans, frankly, like, yeah, exactly. exactly. First of all, run a business at that scale, then get back to me. I run a business mm -hmm. with like, I don't know, at any given moment, three to five people trying to trying to contain the waste, especially with wood fabrication and like reuse it in a realistic way is incredibly difficult. Um, if someone wanted to walk into my shop with a moralistic lens, like uh, sure, they can find something wrong with me. I don't know shit about Zara, but like, yeah, it's not like I mean, I smoke a cigarette here and there. And but like that's the classic designer, right? I remember my teacher being like, I, I wouldn't work for a cigarette company. Um so Zara is come on. But that is funny. I mean, people are just gonna complain about uh, shit. Everyone's you're always gonna piss somebody off or someone's gonna have something to say. But yeah, I mean, if I had a moral problem with what they did, I wouldn't have worked with them. I've turned down projects for I thought my art was being used to kind of cover up something seedy or sell a product that wasn't 
quite up to snuff. And, you know, I just, I don't want to put my name on something like that, but. Do you mind giving an example of that? Because I think it's interesting, like design as deception uh, yeah. versus design as a uh, representation. For sure. There was a, a few months, it was before like everything crashed, but it was when NFTs were really hot oh. and going for obscene amounts of money. I mean, they still are, but uh, somebody reached out and uh, they had a pretty big project like going along. I researched them a little bit and they kind of had some legal trouble with stealing intellectual property, I guess, uh, and a few other things. And yeah, they was, I was basically just going to do some artwork and branding for them to kind of put on top of this NFT project. And they had, I don't know, some pretty big people signed on board. Like I think post Malone was <laughs> something in there and like they're mm -hmm. premiered at Soho house or something like that. Um, but yeah, and it was like, it would have been a really good paycheck, but I was just like, I don't feel comfortable putting my name on this. I don't know enough about it. I'm kind of, yeah, I was just uncomfortable with my art kind of running lead blocker for whatever Interesting amount of money people are going to dump into that, I guess. And then, yeah, a few months later, the whole market crashed on that. I don't know that much about NFTs, but I know people that followed me probably would have bought a couple of them and they would have lost money on it. And I just, yeah, just like stuff like that. It's not always that clear cut, but um, yeah, that's just turning down something I didn't want to attach my name to. Well, it's great to be in a position where you can make those decisions morally. Mm -hmm. Did it take you time to get the right fit client wise, or did you kind of emerge with a clear enough style that the, the work kind of always felt pretty in line with what you were trying to do. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely a learning curve. I, yeah, came about, I came out of design school with sort of this aesthetic that I'm working with now. Uh, my stuff's much better, I think, and kind of have a clear idea of what I'm doing than I did back then. But uh, yeah, my work's definitely kind of, in this space that attracts clients that are, uh, I'm not even sure. <laughs> no, no, it's actually, it, it's an interesting, um, whatever you yeah, were about to say surely would be interesting. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. Like, Hmm. You know, it's like, I can smell or see things. It's like leather. There's like leather involved for sure. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. There's dust. Work attracts dirt. more of a earthy handmade, kind of group of folks i think um which is nice because that aligns with kind of what i want to do anyways i definitely you know you get people that are like hey i'm starting a real estate business like can you do a logo I'm like it's not really what i do so I don't, don't work with those kind of clients i guess but yeah for the most part my work uh has always attracted that group i definitely early on took on projects kind of just like, Oh, there's, they seem nice. Like, yeah, exactly. good. And then we'd, we'd get into it and they'd want something that's very different than what I actually do. And yeah. I would, you know, it would blow up my face. <laughs> I've had plenty of projects go south and, uh, people be unhappy. And I think that's just part of getting better in this field is kind of recognizing how to set yourself up for success. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's the process of building agency in the context of collaboration, which when you're young, I think the client often just swallows you up. It's not their fault, but they can end up kind of using you as a tool, as a means mm -hmm. to an end, unwisely, I would suggest, yeah. because if you're paying someone, a designer, you should be paying them for what they're good at, not for, <laughs> not to just like, direct them or tell them what to be good at because they're not going to be good at it um but then as oh, you develop yeah. that agency it's like i mean shit people have the same problem in relationships right like they could be swallowed whole by the relationship dynamic or they can maintain their autonomy within the context of the relationship and that is it takes a high level of maturity to operate aesthetically artistically and professionally at um 
I've gained a lot of respect for it over time. I think when I was younger, I thought commercial artists were objectively inferior to fine artists. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so clear about that statement anymore. Um, It's a stupid way to think in some ways, but I think I just valued expression over collaboration. And I think I kind of flipped on that for now. Um, The the well of self-expression ran out for me at some point, uh, or at least became less enticing. And interesting. Yeah, it's definitely less romantic than just pure self-expression and yeah, showing exactly what a, what you want to show. And you know, commercialism gets a bad rap for I mean a lot of valid reasons, but uh, especially in the art world. But uh, yeah, kind of like yeah. you were saying. Um, yeah, early on, especially you get a lot of clients that are kind of bargain shopping. They're not good clients, which is it sucks because all these kids that come out of design school that want to make it as freelancers get stuck with the absolute worst overbearing clients that just want to be art directors and kind of view these designers as people that don't really know what they're doing vision wise. They're just, they know how to work the software essentially. So I've talked to friends that came out of design school that just were talented and immediately got soured on freelance and then just went and worked for an agency. Uh, because they had terrible clients. Like, but when you, <laughs> I started out on Fiverr actually, which is just that, you know, yeah, you show up online and somebody hires you to do something. And if you can make it through that, you can kind of make it through anything. Uh, cause that first year, so it was really rough just with, yeah, people not respecting your work or your ideas and just kind of wanting to run rush out of everything. And then, you know, not being happy when it inevitably blows up, but you as a young designer don't know enough about how to handle clients to actually basically set the course straight before it's too late. Uh, And then, yeah, that's something I appreciate now is the people that come to me and the people I work with uh, are paying me just as much for my hand and my work as they are for the ideas I'm uh, trying to bring into projects. which just makes it so much easier. It gets exponentially easier the longer you do this and the uh, kind of bigger reputation you have, I guess. Just more trust is built in. Yeah, it's trial by fire. I think it's a good thing. Um, Totally. It's the only way it can work. Um, And I respect the clarity of what you're doing. I think for me at times, my temptation to pull in the expression of oneself can, which I have like a kind of scattered approach stylistically, a generalist approach that can confuse clients. So that's something I need to work on. And looking at your work uh, inspires me to think about that more is just like how to achieve that clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think just from a marketing perspective that goes just having a very set specific thing that you're putting out into the world constantly people kind of only hire people based on what they can see uh so with me i think it makes it a little bit easier because people know exactly what they're getting whatever we make is going to look a lot like my the rest of my work uh i think people clients definitely get lost when uh they're going through an instagram page or a portfolio and everything is kind of good but very different um, it kind of confuses someone that isn't coming from an arts or design background and kind of doesn't really know what to look for, or how to visualize out what the project could turn into with this person. Whereas with me, it's just so easy to see, uh, yeah. for better, or for worse that it, uh, yeah, kind of takes the, the load off their minds, I guess. No, it's risk mitigation ultimately when the client hires you. And if they know, like, generally, this is where we're going to land, that's very comforting. And I think, you know, it's no different than meeting a stranger. Like, you want to have some semblance of certainty about their behavior. You know, it's like you don't want to see erratic behavior from someone (laughs) upon meeting them. If they feel firm and stable, you're going to get the work, I think. Mm -hmm. In my immature brain in college, I always thought that was, a well, and it is a restraint constriction, but Mm -hmm. 
It's I a good too, one for sure. Absolutely. I definitely went in being like, I'm going to do everything. And it's, yeah, I'm just going to crush it at everything. And yeah, it doesn't. Quite... People, people will accept me for who I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no nonsense. Get it. Like you kind of have to spoon feed folks sometimes, but um, yeah. I mean, that being said, I'm, I'm really never bored. I work in, like I said, a very specific aesthetic, but I always have different kinds of projects coming in and that, yeah, never bored. There's always something new to challenge me or explore. No, I see that you have your kind of vernacular, but it's, um, manipulation and articulation is quite varied. Mm -hmm. So there's like a, which is fun to me personally, is like having these clear little dude, bull, bird, goat, you know, and then just seeing all the manifestations of that thing in different orientations is, is a very satisfying, stable ritual. Mm -hmm. Peaceful, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Thanks. Well, do you have a joke for me? God, I have, I have, you know, the funniest thing I did today was probably Google how to be a good podcast guest. And, uh, oh, that's a funny joke. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not very funny, but it's true. Um, what were the results? Cause I haven't looked up how to be a good podcast host, but maybe there's some corollaries. Yeah. I'm not even sure. Just what were the bullet points. I can't, I don't even remember. I think I spaced out about halfway through, but just, try and listen to questions and not <laughs> so just having a conversation yeah have, exactly have a conversation don't sit there silently probably um, have you been interviewed on a podcast before uh, i've never actually done like a formal podcast i've done a few like instagram live collaborations with people and uh, agencies and stuff like that but yeah first podcast oh right on i'm honored Thanks. Well, if and, you're ever in New Jersey, you ever find yourself in New Jersey, you're yeah, welcome. Man. You're welcome to my home. Oh, I appreciate it. Likewise for Portland. Uh, let me know if you're ever out here. I think you had the, I forget his name, the ceramics guy. He was on my man, Nick ago. Norman. Yeah. He's from out here, isn't he? Yeah. He's great. You should hit him up. He's I'll, a great person. Up. I think I followed him on Instagram, but I'll, I'll uh, look for his stuff around town. He's very inspiring from a ceramic perspective. He's also been dabbling in branding, and I, I think you'd like each other. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I always recommend that people I know get in touch. Not that I know you, but you know what I mean. You know me well enough now. <laughs> I think I I trust my um, my gut when I see aesthetics, and then. I think I know the person pretty well. I don't, I don't think I've been wrong that much in respect to like making friends based on art. I feel mm -hmm. that cause I made a lot of friends early on from Tumblr and um, mm. I just know if I'm going to like someone based on what they make. I, I, it's like 95% of the time has worked <laughs> out for me. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel the same for sure. I've made friends by looking at someone's art and going from there. Yeah. All right. We'll have a good night. Thanks again. Yeah. You too, man. Thanks for having me on. That was fun. Good conversation. For sure. All right. So cool. long. Bye. 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 That was a good time. Music by Dora Varsky and Mingja Chen. Next up, we have Vinnie Newberg.